Welcome to BTI, that's Bible Training Institute. We open the scriptures every week, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little. Study with us and learn how to know God as a close, intimate, and personal friend, and learn what is soon to come upon this world. Would you reverently kneel with me as we approach the Lord in prayer? Heavenly Father, we're living in the last days of this earth's history. And if ever there was a time to develop love so that we might become your friend, it's now. And Lord, that great plan of redemption that you have devised, that you are carrying out right now, that is coming to its culmination, is the plan that reveals the deep love of God. Your love, dear God, to us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And Father, I'm praying that today that you'll give us more love to thee. Every week we should be looking to see if our love is increasing or is it dying. Father, this is what is happening in the last days. Matthew 24 says the love of many shall wax cold. And the only way that we can stand in these last days and become your friend, we must love for a friend loveth at all times. Lord, this is the type of love that we need right now. But Lord, time to develop love is running out. And so I plead that this morning as we study, that you would open up our eyes that we may see. That you would open up our ears that we may hear. That we may be impressed with the spirit of urgency. If if ever there was a time to see this love and to develop this friendship, that the time is now. For the time of love is running out. Abide with us now, Lord, as we go deeper into this study of part one on a bell and a pomegranate. Please bless us, for we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Open up our eyes. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I want us to take our Bibles and turn to the book of Matthew, the 24th chapter, as we go deeper into this study, laying a foundation to understanding a bell and a pomegranate. What are we studying? A what? Bell and a pomegranate. Now you're going to Matthew chapter 24, and we want to lay a foundation this morning. Let's go to Matthew, the 24th chapter. And what I want us to do, see, I believe that as we study for several months, week after week, Sabbath after Sabbath, I believe that we can see the picture of the puzzle coming together and it's getting very clear. I believe that the clarity of the puzzle is making us see that we have to be living in the most solemn and significant time of all the ages. That we're living in the closing scenes of this earth's history. And that everything that we see on the news, I don't care what the thing is, whether it's talking about the Republican convention or the Democratic convention, whether it's talking about the social condition, whether it's talking about disease or the economy, that no matter what we're looking at, all of it somewhere is a handwriting showing us that time cannot continue much longer. Now, if we understand that, then our minds should be saying, if we're living at the very end of the end of time, how is it that the majority of the world don't know it? You know, right now today, the majority of the world are looking forward to years of peace and prosperity. The majority of the world, now there are a few that recognize we're on the verge of a crisis, but the great majority, not only of the world, but even the popular churches, are today believing that things are getting ready to get better and better and better instead of actually getting what? Worse and worse. Now, at this little church, and at this little family church, I want you and I to understand it. I want us to be able to go to the Bible and understand intelligently when we say we're at the end of time or the end of the world's history, I want us to understand not casually, but how? Intelligently. Now, my teacher told me like this. This is how I used to talk. He said there should be no ifs, ands, or buts about it. If you know something and there's an if, what does that mean? You don't know it. You're not sure. If you know something, there's a but, then that means you don't what? You don't understand it. If there's some if or an and or a but, then we don't understand it. We need to be able to go back to the Bible and without a shadow of a doubt say, I know that we're at the end of time. Now, when we can say it like that, then all of a sudden we begin to recognize that there has to be some radical changes inside of us. It can't be I go to church and continue to go to church like I've been going to church and go through the week like I've been going through the week. There has to be something different. So what we have to do now is go back to the Bible and I want us to understand it this way. Do you want to understand it like that? Yes or no? All right. So in Matthew chapter 24, I'm going to ask this a question to help us to understand. This is laying a foundation to help us to begin to understand it this way. 
I can perhaps help us to better understand it by asking this question. What event brings us to the end of the world? Not an if, not an and, not a but. What event, without a shadow of a doubt, brings us to the end of the world? Is that a good question? Yes. Because if we don't know what that is, then how can we know that we're at the end of time, the end of the world's history, if we don't know what that piece, that final piece of the puzzle is that brings us not to the stage of the beginning of the end, but the final piece that literally brings us to the very end of the world. What event does that? Come on, my friend. Brother Tim, you came right on in and just jumped to the front of the class. Praise the Lord. <laughs> so what event brings us to that? Let's write that on the board and let's, then we'll go back to the Bible and make sure we understand that. What event brings us to the end of the time? What event brings us to the end is the second advent of Christ. The second advent of what? Christ. Question. What does advent mean? The word advent comes from a Latin word that means coming. It just means coming. So the second advent, as Brother Tim said, is the second coming of Christ. So if you believe in the coming of Christ, then you know what you can be called? An Adventist. We're talking about identity. Now, so that means that if I believe in the coming of Christ, what if a Baptist believes in the coming of Christ? Then what is a Baptist? An Adventist. If the Catholic believes in the coming of Christ, what is he? A Adventist. Do you know that every Christian should be an Adventist? Now, we'll go back to history and understand this. So we, as we look at the Bible, see, all seven-day Adventism is, is the religion of the Bible. So when you look at those who believe in the coming of Christ, we see our name, Adventists. We see why, because we should believe Christ is coming. Now, how do we know that the second advent of Christ brings the world to an end? How do we know that? Because the first advent did not bring the world to an end. So how do we know that the second advent of Christ is going to bring the world we know to an end? Go to Matthew 24, and notice what the Bible says, beginning in verse 3. Uh, would you read that for us, Sister Chanel? Loud and clear. Matthew chapter 24, and beginning in verse 3. Are you there, amen? amen. All right, verse 3. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately. Now, watch what they do. They ask him a question, but in the question, they suggest something that is right. Let's continue. Now slow down. Continue. And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Verse 3. So what two events does the Bible put together based on that last sentence? What two events? Talk to me. The second, the second, coming, the second coming of Christ and the, end of the world. and the end of the world. How do we know? Does the Bible say so? Yes. So he said, what should be the sign? Does Jesus start delineating the signs then after that? Yes or no? Yes. Same signs in which we get the beginning of the end. The pandemic. The COVID, we looked at this before. But in Matthew 24, we're bringing out something that I want us to see intelligently now so we can understand it carefully. So the event that brings the end of the world is the second coming of Jesus Christ. What shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Good. Now, let's go a little further. Now, do you know that one of the most beautiful texts and promises, one of the most encouraging and most hopeful promise of all the Bible was left to us from the lips of Jesus. About the second coming of Christ. Go to John 14. What book did I say? Now we'll come back to the fact that the coming of Christ brings the end of the world. But go to John 14. You're going to John the 14th chapter. And here in Jesus, he's talking about his second coming, his soon return, or his, his uh, second return. And John 14, notice what the Bible says, beginning in verse 1. One of the most beautiful promises in all the Bible. One of the most encouraging promises in all the Bible. Someone says, well, I'm going through a lot of trouble. Don't worry about that. Let not your heart be what? Trouble. Someone says, I'm in the time of trouble, and there's another trouble coming greater. Well, don't worry about that. Look at John 14. Look what it says beginning in verse 1. It says, let not your heart be what? Even though you're going through a troublesome time outside, whether in your finances or your health or your family or in the world, guess what? Your heart doesn't have to be troubled. We can have a peace that will take us above the storm, even in the midst of the storm. So the Bible is telling us, let not your heart be troubled. Why not, Jesus? Believe in God. What else? Believe also in me. Verse 2. In my father's house are what? He said, look, you don't have to be discouraged on this earth. Why? Because in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to do what? Prepare a place for you. He said, don't be discouraged. 
I don't care what you don't have on this earth. I am going to prepare a place for you that has everything that you need. Amen. Everything. Now, then what did he say? Someone says, I want that place. Verse three. It says, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come the first time. That ain't not what he said. He said, I will come how? What does that suggest if I'm going to come again? What does that suggest? That he's been here before. And while he was talking, he was right there on this earth before he got ready to leave back to heaven. And he said, look, I've come this first time, the first advent, the first coming of Christ. But he says, guess what? I am coming back. And he said, when I come back, it's going to be different than when I came the first time. When I came the first time, I came as a baby, a helpless babe. But when I come the second time, I'm not coming like that. I'm coming as king of kings and lord of lords. I'm coming as a warrior on a white horse. And the government that I'm going to establish, you can be a part of it if you become my friend. This is what Jesus said. Don't be discouraged. Now, he said, I will come again and prepare, he said, come again and receive you where? Unto myself. That where I am, what else? That where I am, there ye may be. Now, how long are we going to be with the Lord when he comes back? The Bible says, so shall we ever be with the Lord. So Jesus promised in John 14 that he's going to come again. Question. How long ago was that? About how long ago? When Jesus was on this earth, about how long ago was that? About 2,000 years. You know what should come to the thinking mind? Listen. If Jesus said 2,000 years ago he wanted to come back, but he hasn't come back yet, then my question would be, why did he not come back? Does not he want to come? Why would he wait 2,000 years to come back the second time? So this is what we need to study intelligently. Now we're going to go through the Bible and we're going to be to understand this and we're going to find out that later on this is going to tie in to a bell and a pomegranate. But we're laying a foundation. Let's go a little further. Now, did the first coming of Christ happen at a particular time? Yes or no? Yes. Will the second coming of Christ be connected to a particular time? Yes or no? Yes. Do you know, brothers and sisters, that the coming of Christ cannot happen at any time? That the advent of Christ, whether the first or the second, are tied to something. Let's go to Galatians in our Bibles. Go to Galatians, the fourth chapter. And I want us to see them. See, history always repeats itself. There's nothing new under the sun. If you want to understand the second coming, all you have to do is study the first coming. And if you understand the first coming, you'll understand something about the second coming. Something controlled the first coming of Christ and something controls the second coming of Christ. Now I want us to make sure we understand that. Go to Galatians, the fourth chapter, and we want to notice what the Bible says in Galatians 4, and we want to see, did the first coming of Christ happen accidentally or was it based on a particular time frame? Look at Galatians 4 and verse 4. Would you read that for us, Sister Kia, please? But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son. What was his son? Who is his son? Who is his son? All right. Made of a woman, made under the law. And verse 5 says to redeem them. So when Jesus came the first time, what does the Bible say he came? When did he come according to the Bible? Galatians 4 verse 4. Galatians 4 verse 4 says when the what? What does that mean? Fullness of time. When it was time. So if I said that, if I said I'm going to come into this church at 1030 a.m. And all of a sudden it's 1029. Is that the fullness of time? No. When would the fullness of time be? 1030. Because it is full feeling time. So the fullness of time is a fulfilling or a feel fulfillment or a filling for the time. So in order to have a fullness of time, there had to have been a time when it was prophesied that Christ would come the first time. Was the first coming of Christ pointed out in the Bible, yes or no? Yes. Was the place of his birth pointed out in the Bible? Yes. What was the place of his birth? Yes. Bethlehem. Was the time of his birth pointed out in the Bible, yes or no? Yes. Now question. If the first coming of Christ was pointed out, then what does that tell me about the second coming of Christ if history repeats itself? That the second coming of Christ will also be what? Pointed out in the Bible, in principle. So we're going to understand this a little bit further. Now, we're going to find out that the second coming of Christ is a timed event. It is a what? Time. Timed event. Let's read this together. Desire of Ages 31. Desire of Ages says, the Savior's, what's that next word? 
coming. Give me another word for coming. Advent. The Savior coming was foretold in where? Genesis 3, 15. The seed will come and begin to bruise the head of the serpent. From the days of Enoch, the promise was repeated through patriots and like that first book of the Confirmation series. Keeping alive the hope of his appearing. And yet he what? Now watch now. Do you know how long it was that Christ did not come? The first advent of Christ. Do you know how long passed by about of human history? About, guess how long? 4,000 years. Can you imagine? Genesis 3.15. He says, I'm going to come. Adam and Eve thought he was going to come when? Immediately. She thought her first son, uh, 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 Abel, was uh, Cain's scheme. She thought her first son, Cain, was what? The Messiah. The Messiah. But he wasn't. And so she was waiting for this to take place. So as we go through the Bible, we're going to find out that this promise happened. Can you imagine from Genesis 3.15, they were looking for the coming of Christ. And for 4,000 years, the promise looked like it slumbered, but it was happening on. It says, yet he came not. The prophecy of what? Daniel revealed the of his advent or coming, but not all rightly interpreted the. So they didn't understand the book of Daniel. So that's why. You and I need to understand intelligently. Now, it says, century after century passed away. The voices of the prophets, what? Cease. Or what does that mean? Stop. Now, from Genesis to Malachi. Now, after Genesis, every prophet talked about the coming of Christ. But in Malachi, Malachi said that, behold, I'm going to send you Elijah before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And after Malachi's prophecy, you have a silence for over 500 years from the Hebrew prophets. And the first voice we hear after Malachi, the voice of the prophet ceasing, guess who the next voice we hear? John the Baptist. And you know what he said? The fullness of time is almost here. The Messiah, Jesus, is about to be born. Man, this is good, brothers and sisters. John came on time, but John understood his identity. They asked him, who are you? You're going to find out that the people that prepare the way for the second coming of Christ must understand their identity. Now, it says... The hand of the oppressor was heavy upon Israel. Remember, Rome shackled up Israel and they were under bondage. It says, the hand of the oppressor was heavy upon Israel and many were ready to exclaim. What were they ready to say? The days are prolonged and every vision does what? Fail it. It says, but like the stars and that vast circuit of the appointed path, God's purposes, no, what everybody? No haste and no delay. In other words, it happens on time. Through the symbol of the great darkness and the smoking furnace, God had revealed to Abraham the bondage of Israel in Egypt and had declared that the time of their sojourning should be 400 years. So God had prophesied how long Israel would be in Egypt in Genesis 15. Against that word, all the power of Pharaoh's proud empire battled how? In, that means that no earthly government can stop the prophecy of God from happening on. I wonder if Egypt couldn't do it and Rome couldn't do it, I wonder if America can do it. So it's important for us to understand this. It says, it came to pass, it says, on the selfsame day appointed in the divine promise, it came to pass that all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. So, in heaven's council, the hour for the, what everybody? Coming of Christ had been determined, and when the great clock of time pointed to that hour Jesus was what born where so Jesus was born on he came his first advent on time and there's nothing new under the sun history will be repeated all this is a type so that what does that tell us about his second coming his second coming will happen guess what on time now this is the great clock of time now there's something that controls the great clock of time there's something that controls why Jesus came the first time and why he came and when he came. Does anybody know what controls the great clock of time? Go to the book of Luke. What book did I say? You're going to Luke. What controls the great clock of time? Go to Luke chapter 21 and we're going to see it suggested here. In Luke chapter 21 and we want to notice what the Bible says beginning in verse 25. You see when he comes he's doing something. Whatever he's doing, the work that he's doing is controlling why he's coming, when he's coming. Now let's look at Luke chapter 21. Let's notice what the Bible says, beginning in verse 25. Sister Debbie, would you read verse 25 for us, please? Luke 21, beginning in verse 25. What does the Bible say there, please? And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars, and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity. 
What else happening? So it shows this commotion in the earth physically and also on a, from a social perspective. We're not studying that right now. But we can see that these are signs that are taking us not to the beginning, but signs that are taking us to the end. end. Right? right? All right. Now, watch what it says. Then jump down. We're going to jump down to verse 28. Jump down to verse 28. Continue on, uh, Sister, uh, Sister Amaya. Would you read that? Luke 21 and verse 20, uh, 27. Pick up in verse 27. See the Son of Man doing what? Coming. This is the second what? At man. The second coming of Christ. Continue. So what we see happening in Luke 21 are signs taking us down to the end and the second coming of Christ, which is the event that brings the end. Then it says, continue. Then what? Why? Why? So it says, your, what is drawing nigh? Your, so why did Christ come the first time? It was a part of the plan of? Redemption. Remember? Galatians 4 said, in the fullness of time, to redeem man. Why is Jesus coming the second time? It's a part of the plan of? Redemption. So then what controls the coming of Christ, whether the first coming or the second coming, is the plan of? Redemption. So then what do we need to study to understand the coming of Christ, either the first time or the second time? The plan of redemption. So if I'm going to understand the end of the world, the only way I can understand the end of the world is to understand what's going to bring Christ the second time. And he's coming to complete the plan of redemption. Because when he comes, his redemption is not over, but his redemption is drawing. Nine. It means it's getting closer and closer to the end. Do we all see that? Yes or no? Yes. So what is controlling the coming of Christ? The plan, the plan of redemption. So if I'm going to understand the end, I've got to understand this plan of redemption. Now, the plan of redemption sets the great clock of time. Guess how long it sets it for? 7,000 years. 6,000 on earth, 1,000 where? 1,000 where? In heaven. Now, the only way to understand that is that we've got to understand more the plan of redemption. Has God given us something to understand the plan of redemption? Yes. What did he give us? The Bible. Now, in the Bible, the whole Bible from Genesis to Revelation is to unfold the plan of redemption. Look what the prophet says concerning this in Education 125. It says the central theme of the Bible. Bible. I can't hear you. The central theme of what? The Bible. The theme about which every other in the whole book clusters is the? Redemption, redemption. The redemption plan. So the entire Bible from Genesis to Revelation is unfolding the plan of? Redemption. That's the central theme. From Genesis all the way to the book of Revelation. It says, from the first intimation of hope in the sentence pronounced in Eden, Genesis 3.15, to the last glorious promise of the revelation, they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their The burden of how many books? Every book and of every what? Passage of the Bible. In other words, every verse of the Bible is the unfolding of this wondrous theme. What theme? The theme, the central theme, which is the theme of redemption. So the plan of redemption is the entire center or foundation of the entire Bible. And as we study together, we've proved this from the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. Now, it says man's uplifting the power of God, which gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. He who grasps what this thought has before him an infinite feel for what? In other words, once you understand that the plan of redemption is unfolded in every verse of the Bible, and that every verse of the Bible is to unfold the plan of redemption, then we're ready to study. It says he has the key that will unlock to him how much? The whole treasure house of God's. So then what do we need to understand to understand everything from Genesis to Revelation? We need to understand the plan of redemption. That's what controls the coming of Christ. That's what brings the end of the world. Now, my next question. Has God given us something in the Bible to better understand the plan of redemption? Because it's so important. What has God given us in the Bible so that we can better understand this plan? The sanctuary. Now, where can I go in the Bible to see that? Now, this should be reviewed as we go a little further. Psalms. Psalms where? Where in Psalms can I go and see that the plan of redemption is carried out in the Bible? Psalm 77. Now, 73 also helps us. That, that helps us as well. But we want to go to Psalm 77. Very good, Sister Minnie. We want to go to Psalm 77. And I want you to see this. Now, question. 
So then what plan do I need to understand if I'm going to understand the end of the world? And if we're living at the end of the world in 2020, the final generation, what plan must I understand the what? Now, I want you to go to the Bible and show me the plan of redemption now. I, I, I took you already to Psalm 77. Now, I want you, where would I find the plan of redemption? Now, I, I'm, I'm trying to get you to help me. See, in order for you to un understand intelligently, you can't look at me and just look back at me and say, okay, well, yeah, you, you said it. Do you know that every one of us need to become students of prophecy, students of the Bible, students of the plan. We need to become a student in Bible Training Institute that we can understand it for ourselves and that we can open the scriptures and show men and women of what is coming upon the earth. We should be able to go back to the scripture. That's why this class is here. Now, if you don't understand it, don't be discouraged. This is what this class is all about. But I want to make sure that we can go to the Bible and understand it for our... The Bible says, study to show thy... All right, question. So this should be reviewed. What text in the Bible shows me that the sanctuary reveals the plan of redemption? What text in the Bible shows me? There's several. I took us to one. What is one place I can go? Psalms. All right. So now where in Psalm 77 does it show me about the plan of redemption? All right. 13. Would you read that for us, uh, Sister Davis? Psalm 77 verse 13. All right, Brother Bill, we're going to put it on him now. We're going to put it on him now. We're going to ask him a question now. Brother Bill, I'm, I'm asking you a question. What, th does that verse say plan? No, please. That didn't say plan. That verse didn't say plan. So how are you telling me that the plan of redemption is going to show me something about God? It says, thy way, O God, thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Now, how are you going to tell me that the plan of redemption is going to show me God's way? When you just show me, when the Bible didn't say plan of redemption. The plan of redemption. So the plan of redemption. All right, we read a little further. All right, let's go read a little further. Where else, where else should I go? Where else should I go, Sister Davis? Where else should I go? All right, let's go to 15. Would you continue to read that, please? Ah, so this tells me that in the sanctuary is what? In the sanctuary is the what? Uh, what does the Bible say? Redeem. So, okay, first, now you see you got to build. You got to build. Right. Every student must build. Right. It says, thy way. way. So the Bible is telling me what's in the sanctuary. In the sanctuary way. is God's way. 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 In the sanctuary is God's way. That's what the Bible says. No if, ands, or buts about it. That's what the Bible says. Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. If I want to find out God's way of doing anything, where do I have to go? Where? The sanctuary. If I want to find out his way of dealing with time, or his way of dealing with worship, or his way of dealing with anything, I've got to go into the sanctuary. That's what the Bible says. Now, my question was, uh, how do we see the plan of redemption? And mommy said, Sister Davis, if we read a little bit deeper, we go a little bit deeper, and when we go a little bit deeper, we see that it told us what way is in the sanctuary. What way was in the sanctuary? God's redeeming way. It says, with thine arm have I, what? Redeem. That was verse 15. So then what way is in the sanctuary? Talk to me. What way is in the sanctuary? The way of redemption. So we can see that God's way of redeeming is in the sanctuary. Now, can everybody see that? Yes or no? Yes. You can see that. Can we see that? All right. Good. Can we see this? Is it clear to everybody? God's way of redeeming in the sanctuary. All right. Now, next question then. We can see that the God's way of redeeming is in the sanctuary, but where is the plan of redemption? I see the way of redemption, but, but, but I thought we said that the plan of redemption is what's going to help me to understand the coming of Christ, either the first coming or the second coming. Are you raising your hand? Yes. All right. Am I? We learned that the way is just another way of saying plan. Yes. Yeah. How do you get that? So when the Bible says way, we don't have to see an exact word. If we understand what a plan is, we know that when the Bible says God's way is dealing with his what? His plan. So then the Bible is telling me that if I want to find God's plan of doing anything, then where do I need to go? Talk to me. If I want to find God's game plan to win the great controversy, I have to go into the sanctuary. 
If I want to find Satan's game plan to win the great controversy, I have to go into the sanctuary. If I want to find God's plan of time, I have to go into the sanctuary. If I want to find God's work of redemption, I've got to go into the sanctuary. And so as we look in, the sanctuary is designed to reveal us the plan. It says, the sanctuary in heaven is the very center of Christ's what? Work in behalf of men. It concerns how many souls? Every soul living upon the earth. So the sanctuary concerns how many souls living upon the earth? Everyone. It opens to view. What opens to view? The sanctuary opens to view the plan of redemption. So if I study the sanctuary according to the Bible, it should reveal to me the plan of redemption. And when I look at the prophet says, everything the Bible says, the prophet says. And everything this prophet says, the... Now later on in the plan of redemption, we're going to find out where this prophet came from. Now it says... It opens to view the plan of redemption, bringing us down to the very what? Close of time. So if I keep studying the plan of redemption, it's going to bring me to the what? Close of time. Give me another name for the close of time. End of the world. So what is controlling the end of the world? The plan of redemption. So if I want to know if I'm at the end of the world, I've got to understand the plan of redemption, which is revealed to me in the sanctuary. Thy will, God. Is in the sanctuary. It will bring me to the very end of time. It will take me from Genesis all the way to the book of what? Now look what this says. Watch now. We never read this one together, I don't believe. Evangelism, page 222. This is a good one. This is a good one. Evangelism 222. Let's read it together. As a people, we should be not careless students, but what? Earnest students of should we be able to look at what's happening, whether it's in the environment with hurricanes and tornadoes and earthquakes? Should we be able to look at what's going on all throughout the world, in the political world, the economic world? And should we be able through prophecy to understand what it means? Yes or no? Yes. Good. So it says we should be under students of prophecy. We should not rest until we become what? Now, what I say I want us to become in this church, I want us to become what? Intelligent as to the end of the world. Not just a, a bird fell out of the sky. We must be at the end of the world. He's like, bird fell out of the sky. It must be in the world. What, what, what's, what, what intelligence is that? Or somebody says, well, there was an earthquake in Virginia. Was there an earthquake in Virginia just a few days ago? It was. That itself is not what gives an intelligent understanding that we're at the end of the world. So we want to go back and understand it intelligently. It says we should not rest until we become intelligent in regard to the subject of the... So if we want to understand prophecy, what do we have to understand to really understand prophecy? The sanctuary. It says, which is brought out in the visions of what? Daniel and what else? John. And there's a reason why God chose Daniel and why, in the Old Testament, why God chose John in the New Testament. We don't have time this morning. But it says, this subject sheds what? Great light on our present position and what's that next work? Work. work and gives us what? Unmistakable proof that God has what? Led us in our past experience. It explains our disappointment in what? Now we found out a number is brought to view. What number? 1844. Now do you know that if a person does not understand the significance of 1844 from the plan of redemption or from the sanctuary, then we do not know our identity. No way we can understand the end of the world. Something happened in 1844 that helps us to understand something about the end of the world. There was a group of people at this time preaching, a group of Adventists. Give me a prominent man who led out in this movement of the early Adventists in the 1840s. A man by the name of William Miller. He had some associates, some friends as they joined in, as they studied. And they were preaching that in 1844, guess what was going to happen? Now there is a relationship between 1844 and the end of the world. And we need to understand it in order to understand our identity. It says it explains our disappointment in 1844, showing us that the sanctuary to be cleansed was not the earth as we had supposed, but that Christ then entered into the what? Most holy apartment of the heavenly sanctuary and is there performing the closing work of his priestly office. So this people were teaching later on as we begin to study that in 1844, Christ entered what place? What place? I can't hear you. What place? No, no, I heard you whispering. I can't. No, 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 no. You can't talk to me like that. You got to talk to me strong. That in 1844, Christ entered what? The most holy place. Good. Christ entered. Now, I'm going to abbreviate. For most, I'm going to put M. 
For holy, I'm going to put H. And for place, I'm going to put T. So in 1844, Christ entered the what? Most holy place. What for? What did it say? What for? It says he entered the most holy, uh, holy apartment of the heavenly sanctuary and is there performing the closing work. So as a priest up there, as a priest, what's he doing in the most holy place? What type of work? Not beginning work, but what? Closing work. Closing work. Closing work. It says the closing work of his priestly office in fulfillment of the words of the angel to the prophet Daniel unto 2,000 and 300 days, let's read that together. Amen. Then shall the sanctuary be blessed. Now, how many did the homework? I see a few little hands going up. I don't see every hand going up. Now, teachers, you want to look at you? Brother Tim, we need to look at him now. We need to look. See, you weren't, you were just coming. We need to look at the rest of the students. I'm reading the chapter. You did good. Now, everybody didn't read, though, so we're going to look at them. <laughs> now, we got to read it. Now, I'm going to come back to that chapter in just a moment. But we want to understand it intelligently from the Bible. So there's something about 1844 that helps us to intelligently, not carelessly, but intelligently to understand the end of the world and the second coming of Jesus Christ. So if I want to study the end, what subject do I need to understand if I'm going to really understand intelligently the end? I'm at, anybody? I'm, I'm, I'm asking. I, I want you to think now. I want you to think intelligently. I don't want you to see, look, you know why we're taking our time? There are a lot of things that we repeat that we don't really understand. And I want us to understand it how? In, now, if we don't know, does God condemn us? Are we a terrible person because we don't know? No. God is trying to help us. This is what the purpose of a school is for, to educate us. My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Not knowledge they don't know, but knowledge that they reject. So we're learning this all of us are learning together. So now the, go to Psalm 73. Go to Psalm 73. If I want to understand the end, I've got to understand what controls the end and the second coming of Christ. What controls that? If I want to understand the plan of redemption, what do I need to study? The sanctuary. Now, let's see if the Bible confirms that. Go to Psalm 73. And uh, uh, Brother Tim, would you read for us verse 16, please? Psalm 73, verse 16. So he said he wanted to understand something, to know something, but it was too painful. What helped him to understand? What was the place of understanding? Look at verse 17. Continue, my brother. I understood what? Uh, I understood their end. So if you want to understand the end, if you want to understand the end, according to the Bible... Where must you go to understand there? See, David said, I didn't understand. But when I went into the sanctuary, then I understood there. Yeah. So if I want to understand the end, where did David go to understand the end? Yeah. So then if we want to understand the end of time, where must we go to understand the end of time? We got to go into the what? Sanctuary. sanctuary. So then the question is, when you hear the word sanctuary, is it talking about this church? You know, this church is called also a sanctuary. sanctuary. So if I just go to the church, I'll understand the end. Is that right? You can go to many churches and you'll be told that you're not at the end of time. You can go to seven Adventist churches and hear that we have another 500 years before Jesus comes. So what we have to do is, what does the Bible mean? When the Bible says sanctuary, now this should be reviewed as we're putting more things together. I'm dumping out some more pieces. But we're grouping them with pieces we've already dumped out. You know, that, you know if you were putting the puzzle together, once you start getting the borders together, then you start grouping pieces and you know sometimes you have a little group over here you don't know where it goes in the big picture yet but you have a little group over here and a little group over here and a little group over here and then eventually what you start doing those pieces of the puzzle you group those smaller pieces into what bigger pieces and it's not anything new but it's learning how to put it together and then the picture becomes new so what we're doing today I'm adding some more pieces but I'm grouping them with things that you already know so that we can go a little bit further so that we can better understand a bell and a so we're grouping. Now, let's go a little further. Now, watch now. What we see then is that if we want to understand the end, we've got to go inside the sanctuary. Now, what is this sanctuary? How do I know what the sanctuary is? Where, what is the real sanctuary? What is, it, what, is it, what is the sanctuary? When the Bible says sanctuary, what is it talking about first, primarily? When the Bible says sanctuary, what is it talking about primarily? 
Thank you, Sister Manny. It didn't look like you were guessing. It looked like you were telling me, I know what it is. And I don't know what you say, but I'm telling you what it is. <laughs> when the Bible says, sanctuary, and please don't forget this. I want you to understand this clearly. When the Bible speaks of sanctuary primarily, the first thing it deals with, the most important thing it deals with, is talking about the sanctuary that's, guess where? In heaven. Now, let's go back to the Bible and please make it down this time so you know it. And in your mind, take mental notation. When the Bible says sanctuary, it means that there's literally a sanctuary in heaven. That's the first step. How do I know that? Let's go to Jeremiah. Let's go to Jeremiah. If I want to understand something's primary thing, the primary understanding, what do I mean by primary? You're going to Jeremiah 17. If a person is going through primary school or secondary school, what is primary school? Which one comes first, primary school or secondary? Primary. What is primary talking about? First. So if I want to understand the primary application of the sanctuary, then I need to go to the first time the Bible deals with sanctuary. What is the first sanctuary that ever existed? Was the sanctuary on earth first or the sanctuary in heaven first? The sanctuary in heaven. So then that tells me then that the primary thing that the Bible deals with with sanctuary is the sanctuary where? In heaven. Jeremiah 17. Jeremiah 17. Beginning in verse 12. Jeremiah 17. Beginning in verse 12. And would you read that for us, Sister Davis? Jeremiah 17 and verse 12. What does the Bible say? Jeremiah 17. Now, this, this is so important. What we're studying this morning is so important. I'm trying to take my time. Am I going too fast? Good, good. Jeremiah 17, verse 12. What does verse 12 say? Jeremiah 17, verse 12. Stop. A glorious high throne from the beginning. This is the primary application. The glorious high throne from the beginning. Continue. Is the place of our sanctuary. So from the very beginning, God had a glorious, not low throne, but a glorious what? Where does that suggest that the sanctuary is from the beginning? High or low? High. High. Look up. Lift up your head. For your redemption draws nigh. High place. Now let's watch. It says, so we see that from the very beginning, the sanctuary is where God's throne is. Where is God's throne? That is the, yeah, it's in heaven. That's true, that's true, that's true. Let's go to Psalms 102. Let's go to Psalms 102. God's throne is his kingdom. That's where he sits. It's where he lives. It's where he dwells. It's his home. So the sanctuary is God's house. What is the sanctuary? God's house. That's why people sometimes call a church a sanctuary because it's God's house. But when the Bible speaks of the sanctuary, the real sanctuary directly, it's not dealing first with, uh, with, with talking about the church, it's dealing particularly with God's home in heaven. The sanctuary from the beginning is a high throne from the beginning, where his throne is. So where God's throne is, is where God's home is, where God's kingdom is, where God's sanctuary is. Look at Psalms 102. Psalms 102. Where is this? Anyway, Psalms 102. And we want to begin in Psalms 102, and we want to read Amaya verse 16. What does the Bible say in Psalms 102? In fact, we'll read verse 19. Psalms 102, verse 19. Psalms 102 and verse 19. What does the Bible say in verse 19? Now, wait a minute. A glorious high throne, high, height. From the beginning is the place of God's sanctuary, Jeremiah says. Now he says, for you've looked down. So if he's looking down, where must the sanctuary be? Uh, Above. Up. Look up. It says, uh, from the heights of his sanctuary, continue. From heaven did the Lord behold the earth. So the sanctuary then is not on earth. The sanctuary is where? In heaven. In heaven the place of God's throne. And from there, he looks down on the earth. Are we all together? Yes or no? Yes. So when the Bible speaks of the sanctuary, what we have to go into is an understanding of God's heavenly sanctuary. Now, we have a problem though. If the only way I can understand the plan of redemption is to go into the sanctuary. If the only way I can understand the end of time is to go into the sanctuary. But the sanctuary is not on earth, but it's in heaven. Then what is my problem then? Why do I have a problem? Why do I have a problem? How many of us have ever been to heaven? We haven't been there. So how can we understand the end if we cannot go to heaven? If we can't get in heaven to understand the plan of redemption, 
How in the world could we understand the end of time if we cannot get into the sanctuary up there? God knew that there would be a problem. God was so loving that he took his house and opened it up to solve the problems of this earth. Isn't that a kind person? Yes. You know what the sanctuary reveals? The love of God. What does it reveal? The love, the love of God. God. I mean, think about it right now. Has anybody ever had problems before? Yes. A person ever had a problem in their life and then a, a, a home says, you know what? I'm going to open up my home and bring you into the home so I can help to solve your problem. What would that reveal? Love. love. So God opened up his home to solve a problem on this earth, a problem in heaven. Now, let's notice what the Bible is telling us, what problem we have. Go to Hebrews 8. What book did I say? We're going to Hebrews 8 chapter. Go to Hebrews 8 chapter. So if I need to go into the sanctuary to understand the end, the sanctuary is in heaven, I have a problem because I'm on earth and I can't get to heaven. How did God solve the problem of allowing us to understand what's, go what's going on in heaven without actually being in heaven? How did God solve that problem? God had something made. He said, I'm going to make a sanctuary on earth, earth patterned after the sanctuary in heaven. heaven, and that everything I'm going to do in heaven and on earth, I'm going to put it in the sanctuary on earth so that as you study it, you will understand what I am doing. Are you following me? Yes. Hebrews 8. Look what it says. This is what the Bible is telling us. Hebrews 8. Hebrews 8 chapter in the first verse. Hebrews 8 verse 1, would you read that for us, Sister Chanel? Hebrews 8 verse 1, please. Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the Son. We have such an high priest who is set up on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. We know where he is now. How do we know where he is? A glorious high priest throne from the beginning is the place of his sanctuary so his throne is in his sanctuary so if he's now in heaven on the throne where is he he's in the sanctuary on his throne so then the bible says now he's in the uh, the true verse two is the true sanctuary verse two continue a minister of the sanctuary where's the sanctuary on earth or in heaven where's the sanctuary in heaven, in heaven. continue So the true tabernacle, the real tabernacle, is the tabernacle or the sanctuary that is in heaven where Jesus is. But in order for man to understand what he was doing, he told them to do something. In fact, look at verse uh, 4. He tells us what the sanctuary on earth was for, that he had Moses build. Look at verse 4. It says, for if he were on earth, he should not be a priest. Verse 4, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the... Why do those priests offer gifts and sacrifices? Why do those priests carry on the work of the sanctuary? Why is there a sanctuary and a service on the earth? Verse 5. Let's see why. Verse 5 says, Who serve unto the example and what else? Shadow of what? So the earthly sanctuary, the earthly priests, and the earthly service was an example of the heavenly sanctuary, the heavenly priest, and the heavenly services. So, though I have not been to heaven, I can know what's going on in heaven by looking at the example of the sanctuary that took place on this earth. It's an example of heavenly things. It's a shadow. Is the shadow important? Yes or no? Yes. All right. Is the shadow the real thing? No. But can the shadow show me what the real thing is doing? Yes. Now, look at the screen again. What do you see on the screen right now? A shadow. Is that really my finger? No. no. Can it tell you what my finger is doing? Yes. Is my finger moving? Yes. How do you know even if you don't see my finger? How many fingers do I have up now? Two. How do you know? So if I want to understand what's going on in heaven, I've got to look at the shadow. shadow. Now we've been going through the Bible and actually seeing what was the shadow was the earthly sanctuary in this service. God said in Exodus 25 verse 8, let them make me a what? sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Now, how does God teach us when he teaches us anything? The sanctuary of the plan of redemption. Go to Proverbs chapter 4. Now, when the sun comes up, how does the sun come up in the morning? Did the sun come up? Did you, did you see the sun? I saw the sun come up this morning. As the sun came up, did the sun come up like this? Early in the morning and then boom! Everything is showing. No. What would happen if the sun came up like that in the morning? If, you're, if the sun came up and just, have you ever been in pitch black darkness and then cut the light on? Have you ever done that before? Yes. It blinds your eyes. 
So you're going to find out that God does not do that. Well, then how does God give us light? Look at Proverbs 4, Proverbs chapter 4, and look at verse 18. Look at Proverbs 4 and verse 18. Would you read that for us, Sister Debbie, please? Proverbs 4 and verse 18, please. It's as the what? So the path that God is leading us on is like what type of path? The path of a shining light. Now, give me an example of a shining light. What is the greatest shining light in the heavens? The sun. So if you look at the path of the sun, then you see how God shines. Well, what is the path of the sun? It shines what? Not all at once, but what? More and more until the perfect day. In other words, it shows you completely everything. So God shows us little by what? Here little and there little. Little by little until we see the what? The whole complete or the perfect plan. So when God first revealed the plan of redemption, did he reveal it all at once? Everything. No. What did he reveal first? Just a what? A glimpse. The first intimate of that plan. The first intimate of that plan of that shining light was in Genesis what? Three. What did man start doing the moment what did God cause man to start doing to try to understand the plan of redemption the moment that, uh, uh, that Genesis 3.15 was given? He, he gave them something called the sacrificial services. Sacrificial services. What happens in that service? Something was what? Sacrificed. Now what happened? What, what was literally sacrificed? What was sacrificed? A lamb. Now that sacrificial lamb was the beginning of man's understanding of the plan of did it show the whole plan? Yes or no? Why did not God show everything all at one time? Man would have been blinded. So God showed how? More and more. Now, I want you to pick up your cross in the shadow. Pick up your cross in the shadow. I want you to show you this for a moment. Go to the cross in the shadow. I want you to go to page uh, 20 and 21. Go to page 20 and 21 and your cross in the shadow. I hope we have the same pages. Go to page 20 and 21. That I want you to go to the last part of 20. Uh, starting where it says, before man was placed on trial. Do you see that? The last, the second to the last paragraph on the cross in the shadow. Did you bring, you didn't bring yours? Okay, next time, bring it next time. No, it's okay, it's no, no problem, we're sharing right now. No problem, no problem. All right, next, we'll bring it every time. All right, would you read that second to the last paragraph? What did it say, before man? You see that? Let's read it together. What did it say? Be, all together. Before man was placed on trial, the love of the Father... And the son for him was so great that Christ pledged his own life as a ransom if man should be overcome by the temptation of the Satan. Remember, he was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Let's continue to read together. It goes on. Christ was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. This wonderful truth was made known to our first parents in the words spoken by the Lord to Satan. What was the words? It, the seed of the woman, shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. What verse was that? Genesis what? That was the beginning of this understanding of the plan of redemption. Now look at the very next paragraph together. It goes on. In order that man might realize the enormity of sin, which would take the life of the sinless son of God, he was required to bring an innocent lamb confess his sins over his head, then with his own hands take his life, a type of Christ's life. In other words, a shadow of Christ's life. Continue. This sin offering was burned, typifying that through the death of Christ, all sin would finally be destroyed in the fires of the... So when David saw the sacrifice and then saw everything being burned, he says, now I understand their end which was the termination of sin in the fires of the last day. Now let's go a little bit further. <clears throat> Continue on. It was difficult for man, surrounded by the darkness of sin, to comprehend these wonderful heavenly truths. In other words, it would have been too bright for him. The rays of light which shone from the heavenly sanctuary upon the simple sacrifices was so obscured by doubt and sin that God in his great what? Love and mercy had an earthly sanctuary built 
after the divine pattern, and priests were appointed who served unto the example and of heavenly things. That's why it's called the cross and its. So if we look at the shadow, we'll understand the real thing. Did we see that from the Bible, yes or no? All he's doing is quoting the scripture. Let's continue. This was done that man's faith may lay hold of the fact that in heaven there is a sanctuary whose services are for the redemption of mankind. So the earthly sanctuary never brought redemption. It was to teach us. It was to make us acquainted with God and his love so that we could see his love for us and become his friend and cooperate with him in finishing the work. But if we don't understand what's happening in heaven, it's because we haven't studied what was taking place in the sanctuary on Now, let's go over to page 36. Go to page 36, same book. Page 36. Go to page 36. Now, well, I'll come to that in just a moment. Now, what we see in the sanctuary then, when the children of Israel came out of Egypt, what did they come out of? They were in bondage. Give me another name for bondage. Slavery. Now, when a person goes through slavery, what happens to their mind? What happens to their education? It's gone. You don't get education in slavery. So when the children of Israel were going through slavery, what happened to their understanding of Genesis 3.15? Gone. That's why everything else they learned, did, did Adam know about the Sabbath? Yes or no? Yes, he did. Do you know that Adam knew about the Sabbath? Did Abraham know about the Sabbath? Yes. All of them knew about the Sabbath. Now, but you will find out that when the children of Israel went into slavery, guess what they forgot? So when God gave them the Ten Commandments, inside the Ten Commandments, after they came out of slavery in Exodus 20, Exodus, exiting slavery, what does it say? How does the, how does the Sabbath commandment start? Remember, Remember the Sabbath. Sabbath. So what does that tell us that Israel should have already known before that time? The seven-day Sabbath. Seven but what caused Israel to forget the Sabbath was that their long time of bondage. What happened to their understanding of the plan of redemption given in Genesis 3.15 after being in Egypt? What happened to that? Just like the Sabbath and his law, it was lost. So instead of God just telling them something that they did not know, he said, you know what? I'm going to teach them again like they're little children. Now, if you're going to teach a little child, what do you normally do when a child is being taught? They've given a bunch of illustrations a bunch of figures now watch what the book says now go to 36 now watch now you page 36 do you see the first per opening of the first per opening of the first paragraph that says having briefly outlined you see that yes. uh, would you read that Amaya, please having briefly outlined just like we have done Now, what happened to their minds by being in Egyptian slavery? Broken, destroyed, ignorant. Now, look at verse next paragraph. Would you pick up there, uh, Sister Minnie? Subjected. Subjected to a life of incessant toil and surrounded by heat of darkness, the children of Israel lost sight of the significance of their simple sacrifices. Continue. Why? Because something happened to their what? Minds. So he taught them the same thing that Abraham knew and all the patriarchs and prophets knew. But now he taught them with more understanding, just like you would teach a little child. So he said, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell on Exodus 25, 8 and 9. So as we look at that, what's he doing? Continue, my sister. Now, are you seeing this? I hope you're getting this. Are you getting this? All right, continue. Because they could not group the truth. Grass. They couldn't understand it. So what is the sanctuary? The sanctuary is a kindergarten form of the plan of redemption. redemption. It's just illustrated. Act it out. Continue. Just as we would use the kindergarten methods to teach children lessons which adults can easily comprehend. Do you see this concept? Yes. So they could have comprehended this before, but because of slavery, they lost it. So God said, I'm going to teach them again, but I'm going to give them a simple illustration. So the sanctuary makes plain the plan of redemption. Like to a little child. 
All right, let's pick up the next paragraph. Uh, Sister Davis, would you pick up the next paragraph, please? And jump to the next one. They're talking about how they drifted away. The, saint, the last paragraph, this sanctuary. This sanctuary was a shadow. Did we see that from the Bible? It was a what? Yes, Continue. Now watch how the sanctuary service was planned. This is good. Now, this is, man, we get, we're, we're, yes, we're a good point. Now, so the sanctuary service was planned. Watch now. Watch how it was planned by God. Continue. So planned by God that all the work. All the what? Work. work. So everything done in the earthly sanctuary was a? Continue. If you were blessed by this study and would like to be a part of the BTI, that's Bible Training Institute, simply have your Bible pen and paper handy and check out our weekly studies by logging on to molministry.com. Hover over sermons, then from the drop down, click the word video. Also, tune in every Friday at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time for the latest. Maranatha.